In the year 1095, Christianity was the dominant religious force in Europe. Islam was a rising power in the East. The Christian church was split in half. The Latin West ruled from Rome and the Greek East overseen from the Byzantine Empire. Overrun by Seljuk Turks that threatened his borders, Emperor Alexios I called for aid. Pope Urban II heard his call and prepared Europe for its first crusade to the Holy Land. We've partnered with Paradox, the people behind Crusader Kings 3, to take a deep look at the logistics of putting on a crusade, all of the moving parts that had to be pulled together, everything that had to be aligned to take tens of thousands of people across thousands of miles into hostile territory. I've come to the Temple Church in London, the base in England of the Templar Knights, who would become so closely associated with the crusading movements over the centuries that followed. A period then seen through a prism of religious duty and glory, but now seen much more clearly as a series of dark moments that have left deep and long lasting scars on the regions it affected. At the Council of Claremont in November 1095, Pope Urban called upon Western Christians to go to the aid of their brothers in the East, to free the Byzantine Empire, but also to carry on and liberate Jerusalem and the whole of the Holy Land from the Fatimid Caliphate. Urban told those who listened on with bated breath that God exhorts you as heralds of Christ repeatedly to urge men of any rank whatsoever, knights and foot soldiers, rich and poor, all to join the crusade. Urban added, for all those who go thither, there will be remission of sin. If they should come to the end of this fettered life, either marching by land, crossing the sea, or in fighting the pagans. This I grant to all who go through the power vested in me by God. This golden ticket, this guarantee of salvation was more than enough for some people to sign up. The crowd enthusiastically chanted back to the Pope, Deus vult, Deus vult. God wills it, God wills it. Who would sign up to Urban's crusade was going to be critical to its success. The more wealthy and powerful and influential men who were willing to join, the better for Urban. Hugh of Vermandois, the younger brother of the King of France, and Robert Curtoz, the Duke of Normandy, brother of William II of England, were amongst the highest profile noblemen to sign up. Other key men, were Raymond IV, the Count of Toulouse, Stephen, the Count of Blois, Robert, Count of Flanders, and Godfrey of Bouillon. And their spiritual leader would be a man named Adhemar of Le Puy. But all of these men, rich and wealthy as they were, were the ones who had the most to lose, the most to fear, and the most plans to make if they were gonna be away from home for a long time. Now, in theory, there wasn't too much to worry about. Amongst the Pope's promises was one that he would protect the lands of anyone who went on crusade. No one was allowed to take your stuff while you were away doing God's work. But in reality, nothing's ever quite that simple. Even if you didn't have to worry too much about that, you still had to be concerned about who would maintain your estates, keep income, and keep law and order while you were away. All of the things that a Lord was expected to do on his own lands, that meant appointing someone to do it for you. That could be your wife, it could be an oldest son, it could be a trusted, experienced advisor. But what if there was nobody? What if there was bitter competition for who it should be? Making the wrong decision at this point could cause immense problems for someone's return. And this was just the first thing that Crusaders had to worry about as they prepared to leave for the Holy Land. One of the first, and amongst the richest, to take the cross was Raymond IV, the Count of Toulouse. Taking the cross meant literally accepting a cross that was stitched onto a piece of cloth and sewn on to the Crusader's tunic, normally on the shoulder. And this is what denoted people as God's warrior. It identified them as Crusaders. The sources tell us that Raymond sold all of his lands to build his war chest for the Crusade. That might be an exaggeration, 
but the amount of money that these people needed to raise was eye-watering. Robert, Duke of Normandy, mortgaged his duchy to his brother, William II of England, for 10,000 marks. But everybody was cashing in all that they had to place their bets on the spiritual and the temporal success of Urban's crusade. So how did they encourage these thousands of men to sign up for the crusade? The Pope had laid the spiritual groundwork nicely with his promises of salvation. Monks who were amongst the best educated and greatest orators of the period helped as well. Their fire and brimstone preaching encouraged hatred of those in the East alongside the promises of a place in heaven. For some, that was enough. For others, they needed a more temporal reason to go along with the crusade. Bohemond of Taranto was a Norman knight who was making his fortune in the south of Italy. He was encouraged by the idea that he may get a lordship and lands and wealth of his own in the Holy Land. And he was precisely the kind of man that Urban wanted for his crusade, an experienced, well-known warrior who needed a place to call home. There was competition amongst the knights to see who could raise the largest retinue. Raymond of Toulouse had one of the largest numbering in the thousands. It comprised barons, knights, squires, servants, but also women and children, and a brigade of writers who were gonna record the crusade for Raymond. If he succeeded, he wanted to make sure it went viral. Throughout this whole process, all of the layers of society were talking to one another. Men were talking to their superiors, to their neighbors, and to those that owed them allegiance. They were trying to work out how they could travel. Some of them agreed to meet up. Robert, the Duke of Normandy, Stephen, the Count of Blois, and Robert, the Count of Flanders, all agreed to converge on one spot so that they could leave together. But this brought with it its own problems. Who wants thousands of testosterone-fueled, spiritually inflamed knights camping in their garden? It sounds like a recipe for disaster. Finding a date to set off was the next challenge for the Crusaders. For most of them, as soon as possible was preferred. They were paying men and for food and things like that now, which meant they couldn't sustain this indefinitely. Pope Urban had preached the crusade at Claremont in November 1095. Raymond IV set off from Toulouse in October 1096. It had taken him almost a year to raise the money, gather the men, tie up all the logistical loose ends that needed to be resolved before he left. Frankly, I'm amazed he managed to do it all in under a year. The idea for those traveling in these groups or alone was to converge on the gates of Constantinople. Constantinople, now known as Istanbul, and previously Byzantium, from which the empire had taken its name, was the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire. Alexios styled himself Roman Emperor and ruled over people he considered to be Romans. Alexios's daughter, Anna Komnena, wrote a chronicle known as the Alexiad, in which her father and her mother are quite often the heroes. And it gives valuable, if often biased insight into the events of the First Crusade. The next thing the Crusaders had to decide was which route to take. There were two real options, by sea or by land. The sea route wasn't very much used in the First Crusade. Most of the armies traveled by land, but that brought with it its own problems. 3,000 miles in the saddle would be uncomfortable, and that's if you could afford a horse. Otherwise, you're walking all the way. You had to negotiate your way through friendly territories, but you needed all of the right permissions to travel. And you had to be able to supply your army from the lands that you were traveling through too. Then there was also the potential that friendly lands could have been made hostile by those who had gone before. The main body of the crusade that was led by the noblemen is known as the Prince's Crusade. But alongside that is something less well known that's called the People's Crusade. This was made up of common folk, unattached to nobility, led by an enigmatic preacher known as Peter the Hermit. It was poorly organized, badly equipped, and ill-disciplined. They'd committed atrocities against Jews from Germany all the way through their route, relying 
on their pardon from the Pope that went with being a crusader. When they reached Hungary, they fell to looting to find food in the local countryside, and that resulted in an armed response from the Hungarian government. There was a battle, and around 10,000 crusaders were reportedly killed. The People's Crusade all but finished before they'd made it off Christian soil. When Godfrey of Bouillon brought his army to the Hungarian borders, he found this once friendly territory closed off to him, and he had to spend days renegotiating access to territories that the People's Crusade had made fearful and hostile. The next question was, how do you supply a huge army traveling over such a distance? There are no firm numbers for the amount of people who traveled with the First Crusade. The best estimates are that it was around 50 to 60,000 people that was made up of 7,000 knights with their squires, servants, retinue and families as well. Each knight would probably have had three horses with him, the one he was riding, the palfrey, the war horse that he wanted to take into battle, and the pack horse to carry his equipment, making altogether around about 20,000 horses. Each horse needs about nine kilograms of food a day and 30 litres of water. If we do the maths on that, that takes 180 metric tonnes of food and 600,000 litres of water just for the horses every day. Then there's the other pack animals. For every horse, there was probably a donkey and a mule, each needing a similar amount of food. Add to that around a kilogram of food for each person and we're over 600 metric tonnes of food a day. That's the equivalent of about 14 articulated lorries being emptied by this army every single day. If they left home with about two weeks worth of supplies, which is probably the amount that they could be sure wouldn't perish too quickly, that would be eight to 10,000 tonnes worth of food. If a cart could carry around a tonne, then we're talking eight to 10,000 carts, and each one of those would need two oxen to pull it. So we could be looking at around 20,000 oxen on top of everything else. And each one of those oxen needs food and water too. You can see how all this ramped up and got really out of hand. Once that initial supply of food ran out, there were a couple of ways that they could resupply the army. There was foraging or looting once you got into enemy territory, but that had to wait until you got into enemy territory as the People's Crusade had amply demonstrated. The other way was to buy food along the route. That relied on two things, a chunk of the money that all of those noblemen had been able to raise from selling and mortgaging their lands and their properties, and also a ready supply that was large enough to meet the needs of the army. That in itself could be a problem. In the previous few years, Europe had undergone periods of famine that meant reserves were low. This army might well have caused mini inflationary bubbles as it traveled everywhere, as demand far outstripped supply almost overnight. To help break this up a bit, the armies traveled slightly separately, taking varying routes to make sure that they weren't clearing any one route of all of the available food along the way. Converging on Constantinople brought with it its own set of problems as the Crusaders sought to leave Europe and enter Asia and enemy territory. Emperor Alexios had believed he was going to get a mercenary army that would be at his disposal to take back his lands from the Seljuk Turks. What he got, in fact, was an army that brought its own leadership and its own agenda to his doorstep. He was worried about what these men might do if he let them into his lands. Bohemond of Taranto in particular had been a thorn in the emperor's side for a long time. Alexios forced all of them to swear an oath of fealty to him. Everyone agreed with the exception of Raymond IV who would only offer an oath of friendship and a promise to return any of the emperor's lands that they were able to take back. That had to be enough to soothe Emperor Alexios's concerns. Anna wrote in her chronicle of these Franks who arrived on the doorstep of her home city that they were famed throughout Christendom for their uncontrollable passion, their erratic character and their unpredictability. It was hardly the warm welcome the Crusaders most have hoped for when they arrived in Constantinople. As they left, they became one army. Raymond was generally, though tacitly, accepted 
as their leader, Beaumont led the vanguard, the forwardmost part of the army. They were all now required to set aside their differences, to lay down their egos as they crossed the Bosporus. And just like that, they weren't in Europe anymore. If you've ever played Crusader Kings 3, you'll appreciate how important it is to understand your enemy. One of the problems the Crusaders faced was that these hostile territories that they were in now were the homes of their enemies. It was where they lived and where they knew how to fight. Mountain passes made a great place to ambush Crusader armies along the route. They would fight against guerrilla hit and run tactics at every turn. One thing that worked in the Crusaders' favour was that the Muslim world into which they'd marched was fractured, as riven by faction between the Seljuk Turks and the Fatimid Caliphate as Western Europe that they'd left behind. It meant that the Islamic world was poorly prepared for what was about to happen to it. The further south and east the army travelled, the more unfamiliar the conditions became. In the hot, arid atmosphere, they began to worry that they bought the wrong armor, that they were ill-equipped for desert warfare. They were in enemy territory now, which meant they could pillage for food, but they couldn't find food easily. The enemy made sure it was out of reach. As food and water became harder to come by, they looked to the sea to be resupplied, but the ships weren't always there. Some of these men had been to the Holy Land before on a pilgrimage, but it was a whole different ball game coming here to start a war. As they began to move more slowly through hostile territory, that brought with it a whole new threat as well. This mobile army needed to camp regularly. That meant building and then breaking down a canvas city for all of them to stay in. Thousands of people crammed into close proximity, poor food supplies and heat they weren't used to was a recipe for disease. Every medieval campaigning army had to worry about an outbreak of plague and illness in the camp that could devastate an army. The further they moved into hostile territory, the more they had to worry about this new foe. It's worth giving a little bit of thought here to the prevailing military tactics of the day. Western Christian military thinking relied heavily on a book called De Re Militari, written by Vegetius. It taught that battles were to be avoided as an absolute last resort. They were far too unpredictable and there was no way to guarantee victory. The preferred method of pursuing war was the siege. The purpose of a siege was to seal off a town or a city or a fortress and trap those within and force them to run down their supplies by making sure that no food, no water, and no reinforcements could get into them. And then you just wait. How long the siege might last would depend on how well stocked the town was to begin with, how well you choked off their supplies, and on the strength of the resolve of those within. The siege engines that we see in Hollywood movies, particularly those that are rolled towards city walls, were a rarity during this period. They were expensive and hard to put together and timber was in short supply in the Holy Land. They did appear, but not very often. Generally, you were required to wait. Wait for the town's supplies to run out, wait for the people to surrender. The first action came at the siege of Nicaea. All of these cities were important for the Crusaders to take because of their strategic location, but that location had been chosen to make them nice and easy to defend as well. Nicaea was in a lake, and that made it very difficult for the Crusaders to cut off its supply lines and almost impossible to effectively lay siege to. The town remained strong until Emperor Alexios sent a fleet of ships across land, rolled on logs from the sea to float them into the lake. The sight of these caused those within the city to panic and surrender. The cooperation between the empire and the crusaders was a good sign, but it wouldn't last. From here, the crusader army split a little. 
Baldwin of Boulogne made his way to Edessa. He very quickly took the city and the surrounding area. And Emperor Alexios allowed him to keep it and to rule it as a county, giving Baldwin the patrimony in the Holy Land that he had craved. The rest of the army carried on south to Antioch. This was a vast city halfway between Constantinople and Jerusalem. It was so large that there weren't enough crusaders to surround it and effectively besiege the city, which meant that it remained well supplied and defiant. They camped outside for eight months, during which hundreds of crusaders starved to death or began to desert. Eventually, Bohemond found somebody inside the city who was willing to betray it to the crusaders. He managed to get inside and the Christians within welcomed them. All of the Muslims inside the city's walls were slaughtered. Soon after that though, the besiegers would become the besieged. The victorious crusaders were trapped inside Antioch by a relieving army that had arrived too late to save the city. But now they were stuck inside walls that had no more food and no more water to sustain them. After just four days, the Crusaders took the decision to march out against the Muslim army that numbered probably double the amount that they had. Somehow, against all of the odds, they managed to win. The Muslim forces' discipline broke and they fled. Bohemond wanted to keep Antioch for himself. Raymond was having none of it. They promised to give it back to Emperor Alexios if they'd managed to win it. Bohemond argued that the emperor hadn't turned up to help them as he'd promised and therefore their vows to him were null and void. It was true that Alexios hadn't turned up, but the reason for that was that amongst those who had abandoned the siege of Antioch was Stephen of Blois, and he'd made his way back to Emperor Alexios and told him that everything was going horribly wrong and that had caused Alexios to turn back. The Crusaders wasted time lingering in Antioch. There was an outbreak of the plague caused by their failure to move and the cramped, unhealthy conditions. Adhemar of the Puy, the spiritual leader of the crusade, died as a result of that plague. And he was buried in a hole in which they'd found the Holy Lance, a relic, supposedly the weapon that had pierced the side of Christ on the cross, which they'd discovered in Antioch. The Crusaders continued south towards Jerusalem. Along the way, they laid siege to various towns, some with success and some they were forced to leave uncaptured. During the siege of Marat, there were reports that due to the desperate lack of food, the Crusaders resorted to cannibalism, eating the dead so that they could remain alive. One Islamic commentator talking about the defeat suffered to the Christians called them a shameful calamity to the cause of Islam. When the Crusaders reached Tripoli, which Raymond IV had hoped to set up as a principality for himself to rival Antioch, he found the Muslim emir there tripping over himself to provide them with horses and food and supplies. He even offered to convert to Christianity if they would drive out the Fatimids. All of a sudden, the Muslims were more keen to trade with the Christians than they were to fight with them. On June the 6th, 1099, Bethlehem was captured. And on the following day, the Crusaders arrived outside the walls of Jerusalem. Many of them seemed to weep at the sight of the city that they traveled for almost three years and thousands of miles to reach. The Crusaders now lacked the resources to effectively lay siege to Jerusalem. Food was scarce. There was no water within miles of Jerusalem. The defenders of the city had made sure of that. On top of this, there were only about 12,000 of the 50 to 60,000 Crusaders who had crossed the Bosporus left. And amongst them, tensions were running high amidst the stress of illness and shortage and squabbling over what might be the proceeds of the crusade to come. They were left with only one utterly unappealing prospect, and that was to take the city by direct assault. In June, they made a first attempt. They made it over the outside walls, but were repelled by the inner defenses of the city and forced to retreat. The Crusaders began to build siege engines using timber supplied by English and Genoese ships. 
the Italian merchant states like Genoa and Venice would grow incredibly rich, securing trade monopolies in return for help like this. The priest had a vision which assured the Crusaders that if they would fast for three days and then process around the city barefoot, it was guaranteed to fall to them. They gladly performed this homage to the Battle of Jericho and then launched an attack on the city. They attacked on the 13th of July and it took until the 15th of July to penetrate the northern defences. But as soon as they did, there was a panicked response throughout the city and Jerusalem fell. What followed was an unforgivable slaughter, faith being used to justify the most extreme and cruel violence. Muslims and Jews were slaughtered in the streets of Jerusalem. One chronicler described the piles of heads and hands and feet in the houses and in the streets. And others talked in apocalyptic, biblical terms of wading through the streets of Jerusalem in blood. Almost three years after leaving home, and almost four after the crusade had first been preached, Jerusalem had been taken. Their planning had been long and detailed, though much of it had fallen apart on contact with the harsh realities of the Holy Land. Fierce determination, a divided enemy, and it must have seemed to them the favor of God had led them to success. They now set about trying to work out how the Holy Land should be ruled. For some of the leaders of the crusade, this had been on their mind from almost the very beginning. Fortunes and dynasties could be made in the newly Christianized lands. Baldwin of Boulogne already had Edessa where he ruled as a count. Bohemond of Taranto oversaw Antioch as a prince. It was decided that Jerusalem would be a kingdom, the seat of Christian power in the Holy Land to oversee the rest. Raymond, as nominal leader of the crusade, was offered the crown first, but he refused, shuddering at the thought of ruling over a city where Christ had suffered. Instead, it was settled on Godfrey of Bouillon. Although he refused to accept the title King of Jerusalem and preferred to be known as the defender of the Holy Sepulchre, insisting that the only true King of Jerusalem was God. For most of those who'd taken part in the crusade, they considered their pilgrimage and their duty to be done now and considered setting out for home. The logistics of the journey back would be every bit as tricky as the journey there. They were buoyed by their spiritual success, but would begin exhausted. There were less mouths to feed, but the distance was still the same. The movement would spawn organizations like the Knights Templar, whose London home we're in today. They were originally set up to protect the pilgrim routes and pilgrims along the way, and travelers were grateful they showered the Templars with money and lands across Europe, which made them exponentially more and more powerful. Their power would ultimately be their downfall, but that's a story for another day. For those who decided to stay in the Holy Land, the Crusader states became home. The Kingdom of Jerusalem, the Principality of Antioch, the counties of Tripoli, where Raymond IV would eventually establish himself, and Edessa. But as anyone who's played Crusader Kings 3 will know well enough, winning land is only the beginning. Now you have to rule it, always keeping one eye over your shoulder for the next person who wants to win it from you. Welcome to the History Hit YouTube channel. Hope you enjoyed that video. And if you'd like to see more videos where we attempt 
to try and bring history to life. Uh, please don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell. Cheers, guys. See you soon.